Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everybody. And it's a great pleasure to be here, in spite of the fact that I had to shorten my holidays, as uh, was said by Jody Garber <laughs> this morning. It's really a privilege to, to attend this meeting, to be invited on behalf of WMO to speak. And um, I think uh, I'm very grateful also for the Department of State and Secure World Foundation for organizing this event, because it's very true that space weather is a global challenge. So I'm <clears throat> just in a nutshell, without uh, spending too much time, I'd like to recall that the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, is the specialized agency of the United Nations for meteorology, understood as weather and climate issues, operational hydrology, and related geophysical sciences. And so there's nothing in this which explicitly refers to space weather. However, very important decisions have been made a few years ago. First of all, in 2011, when members in the WMO Congress recognized that a coordinated effort by WMO members is needed to protect against the global hazard of space weather. One thing is to recognize the need for an effort. Another thing is to recognize that WMO has to play a role in this respect. And this was a major decision made last year at the WMO Congress again to engage in international coordination of operational space weather monitoring and forecasting with a view to support protection of life, property, and critical infrastructures. And here I would like to, to echo the words of uh, Pekka a few minutes ago, saying that, yes, we need a framework to coordinate operational activities. And the, the, the objective here is really to enable the members to establish operational space weather services in sharing observation data and products, sharing best practices, ensuring interoperability of the various uh, observations and the various uh, products which are delivered, ensure standardization in order in particular to coordinate a response to some major requirements. And one priority today is to coordinate a response to ICAO requirements for aviation. So I'll come back to these points later on. But first of all, I would like to say that uh, we have, before reaching this decision, we established an interprogram coordination team on space weather six years ago, which already involves experts from 26 countries, including seven, also seven international organizations, including ESA, for instance. And uh, one of the co-chair is uh, Dr. Onsager, Terry Onsager, uh, who is uh, very actively uh, helping this, this team to progress. And today, we are aware that there are a number of existing space weather forecast centers or regional warning centers. Many of them are members of the so-called ISES, International Space Environment Service. And we, we could go through uh, many of these uh, uh, many of these centers. For instance, they say, well, I don't know if it works, but for instance, uh, well, uh, no, okay, well, uh, each of them has is issuing forecasts. For instance, uh, this is uh, Australia and uh, uh, China, Canada, etc., etc. We heard about, uh, uh, of course, uh, NOAA SWIPSI and uh, UK Met Office presented by, by Mark, etc. All these centers are doing a remarkable job, but what is missing today is to put all this into a common framework in order to have a global system, making sure that products can be interoperable with each other, making sure also that uh, they are uh, complementing each other. Of course, you, you need to have some, uh, some parallel work which is uh, stimulating, but sharing the data, etc. And in this respect, um, WMO has agreed to uh, develop a four-year plan for space weather. This plan is still uh, needs to be endorsed by the next Executive Council, but it's been already supported by the Congress, so it's, uh, I'm pretty sure that it will be endorsed next June. And what this plan addresses, maybe you can treat the fine print, but I will say in a, just a, a few words, in a nutshell, in the bottom row, these are system level activities. The foundation is to enable, to work on observation, to work on data management, to work on science and methodology. Then the intermediate row is to work at the product and services level, 
requirements, developing best practices for specific applications, and training capacity building. At the upper level is just coordination, communication, what we're do doing today. Today is an important event in order to raise awareness, in order to communicate on what needs to be done and what is being done. Just to give a few more details, at the system level's activities, the, the idea is to coordinate observational assets and plans to ensure continuity and interoperability of space weather observations, whether they are space-based or ground-based. Continuity, long-term continuity, and I think the point was made a few minutes ago by Jussie. To take advantage when relevant of the integration of meteorological observations and space weather observations. Because in many cases, there can be commonalities. In particular, there the, are the a number of uh, space weather uh, monitoring uh, payloads about uh, meteorological satellites, for instance. And also to support the information exchange through the WMO information system, through this framework, through these standards, practices, and policies. Mention was made uh, earlier this uh, morning uh, to WMO Resolution 40, which is one element of this policy of data exchange. Also to dialogue with the meteorological and climate community in terms of modeling, verification, etc. At the service level activities, the idea is, first of all, to organize WMO members to deliver coordinated services responding to IQ requirements. And I'll provide some detail later on. But also to prepare for extreme events in a multi-hazard disaster risk reduction approach to analyze requirements for applications, including other applications such as ionospheric disturbances uh, on, with impact on GNSS, satellite operations, ground infrastructure such as power grids, etc. So we're not only, uh, the idea is not only to talk about that, is the, the purpose is not only to say that we need to cooperate, but to actually start action to do this. So let's uh, indicate briefly what is being done in terms of space weather observation. We did not wait for the adoption of the plan. In fact, we started to work on these observation issues a few years ago through this ICTSW. But just to give an idea of what can be done, you know, it's one of the jobs of WMO is to ensure that we have observing networks which are operational for weather and climate and hydrology. And a lot of, a number of networks are uh, existing. We have thousands of, uh, of oceanic uh, buoys, for instance, on the ocean. We have uh, several dozens of meteorological satellites maintained by WMO members participating in the space-based observing system. There are um, hundreds of um, monitoring stations of the atmospheric composition around the world, uh, tens of thousands of weather stations uh, on the continents, aircraft, ships, etc. All these are operational networks which are delivering huge amount of data every day which are uh, maintained etc and um, uh, corresponding to certain standards and managed according to certain metadata standards etc etc so the idea is to not only um, maintain such observing networks for weather for climate for uh, upper ocean parameters for atmospheric composition but also for space weather and the first step is to develop requirements. So this uh, ICTSW team has already worked in delivering a first set of observing requirements which are documented in the database and kept under review, which address various applications. This is a step for uh, a basis for maintaining a, a gap analysis, issuing us what we call a statement of guidance for future observations. And for instance, in the f among the, the, the guidance, will be a priority uh, to uh, expand uh, and maintain con long-term continuity of solar solar wind observations of uh, comprehensive uh, ionosphere monitoring and ensure also the near real-time data availability of those data which exist but are not necessarily available now and needs to be shared so this is one step and then uh, an example which is just uh, quite new is to build on this in order to make plans and we are maintaining what we call a vision of the space of the observing system today we're working on the vision of the space-based observing system in 2040 and as part of this vision 
there are several items which belong to space weather observations, which have been identified already. This is still to be endorsed. This is still in progress. But just to show the, the, the approach, what we are working on, because once we have a common vision, which is shared by all the WMO members, then it's very likely that the plans of the various members will converge into contributing to meet this vision. At least this is how it has been working so far for weather and climate observation. So I'm, I trust that it will be the same for space weather. In terms of space weather services to international air navigation, uh, WMO and ICAO are working closely together. In fact, they are both responsible to establish a regulatory framework for what is called Meteorological Service for International Air Navigation, which is a topic of ICAO Annex 3 and WMO technical regulations. So these are legally binding documents where are specified the commitments of the various countries to deliver uh, information to support aviation. And in this context, uh, space and environmental parameters have a critical impact, it has been said already. We need to monitor these hazards to support decision making, to minimize the risk through alert, warning, forecast, saying when some things are going to happen, how long it will last, where, how severe, referring to some standard scales. And we need to make sure that the information is consistent globally because the users are cross-border. It has been said already. This is uh, why we are heavily involved in collaborating with ICAO on the definition of space weather services to global aviation with a number of uh, other players. And uh, today we're working on the concept of operations of ICAO. And the, uh, for instance, in the United States, the FAA is heavily involved in leading this effort. The aim is to have an amendment of the ICAO Annex 3 entering into force in November 2018. So this is a very concrete deliverable which we are aiming at. In terms of disaster preparedness, um, we can certainly uh, encourage the examples, uh, to follow the examples of uh, countries such as uh, the UK, as explained by uh, Mark Gibbs uh, a few minutes ago, um, we should make sure that all the members identify space weather in their national risk registers, should encourage incorporating space weather in the multi-hazard early warning schemes, and uh, foster common best practices in terms of adopting common hazard scales and uh, fostering uh, data exchange. Just to conclude, because I think we are short of time, I'd like to say that space weather is a science in progress, but routine operational services are delivered already by centers around the world to respond to the needs of an increasingly vulnerable society. International coordination is without any doubt required to strengthen observations, to strengthen data exchange, to expand best practices and ensure that uh, uh, things are interoperable and standardized. A priority to support aviation. The benefit will be to improve services, to leverage the capability of existing centers, sharing observation effort, sharing development effort, and WMO is providing a collaboration framework for its members to pursue these goals. And here, I would like to insist just on these words. We should not say WMO is doing that, so members don't, don't need to act. No, it's just the contrary. WMO is doing that, which means that WMO members agree to share some effort within WMO because they are convinced that in doing things together, they will benefit of it and the whole community will benefit of it. So thank you very much for your attention.